been here. Uh, we've been singing together. We've been spending some time together and just going over a few of the announcements. But for those of you that are joining us online, I want to say welcome. I am so glad that you've chosen to join us, that you are uh, welcome here. We love that you're a part of us wherever you may be in the United States. If you are joining us online today, you are live, and so I want to just invite you to, to join in on that chat box. Say hello. Tell us where you're worshiping from. Any point in the service, you can click on that live prayer, and that will, uh, that will take you to a private chat to be able to have prayer time. And then also, there's a little heart there that you can click on. It's like saying amen, but we're really glad that you've chosen to join us. And we have a, a, a much bigger crew here today, and I I believe that as, as time goes on, we're just going to continue to fill up, and we're going to get right back to the community of being together, and I know that God is going to bless it abundantly. This last week, I don't know if, if, uh, if you read the email or not, but uh, we did lose one of our, our family members this last week. Dorothy Shock passed away. That's Iva's sister, and so uh, please keep Iva in your prayers. Iva, we love you. We are praying for you. Uh, we are here for you, and uh, keep Keep making phone calls and writing notes and just let her know that, uh, that we are, we're right there, we're right there with you, Iva, every, every step of the way. It is now time for our children's story, and so if uh, the young people, you guys want to pay attention to the screen today, or you can come down and sit right up here in the front if you want to. Those of you that are online, I invite you to, to get a little bit closer, as we have a story that uh, kind of goes along with what we talked about last week. What a nice day for a ride. Oh dear, somebody hurt him. I hope they don't hurt me. Sounds like a wonderful idea. We would love to meet up with you. Oh, okay. well, we don't have time for that. Oh, yes, we'll be there. Just about 10 minutes, we'll be there. Okay, thanks. Bye. Ooh, what a beautiful day for a walk. Oh! <laughs> Are you okay? It is now time for our scripture, and then Dan will lead us in our congregational prayer. Today's scripture reading is found in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such despicable people, even eating with them. Happy Sabbath. For those here in the sanctuary and for those of you at home, if you are able and would like to kneel with me in prayer. Hey,
Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your everlasting love, for the gift of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for the hope of life eternal in a world that is made new again. Father, we pray that you forgive us where we have fallen short. We ask now for your indwelling Holy Spirit. We pray that you would send your Spirit in each and every soul all across this globe. Father, we lift this world up to you. It is definitely growing in a state of chaos and divisions and and all of these things that, Father, should not be a surprise to us as you have foretold of these things. We pray that you will now give us the peace that surpasses all understanding and help us to see these things as the signs that you have intended them to be. But we nonetheless, we lift up the people who are suffering, who are hurting, who are sick, Father, we lift up your children that um, may be fearful, may be uh, uncertain. But Father, give us the measure of faith that helps us to trust in you implicitly with, with our lives and with our needs and with our hope. And Father, we, we want to especially just lift Iva up to you, Lord, and all of the the loss that she has incurred continue to strengthen her and, and her family. And Father, as a congregation, help us to be the arms and, and the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and just the love of Jesus to all of those around us, to our church family and to our neighbors. Father, we ask now that you will be with Pastor Stephen. Father, that you would imbue your spirit upon him and to give him uh, the message and the clarity to deliver it. And Father, open our ears to receive it, that we can grow in our depth and understanding of your love for us through your truth. We thank you, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Being an introverted pastor is not an easy thing to be. Being an introvert in general is not easy. Just, I'm curious, how many of you would consider yourselves an extrovert? Would you raise your hands? An extrovert, where you thrive on, and you get energy by being around people and with people, and that's, that's all you need. How many of you would consider yourselves introverts? where we would, we're, we're okay being by ourselves, you know? I think it's, I don't know if any of you saw, there was a, a video that was going around that uh, talked about the difference between an extrovert and an introvert within quarantine. And it was just really funny because it was, you know, some people would be like, man, I just gotta get outside and I gotta go be with people. And the other person's like, nah, this is really nice. <laughs> and so, so some of us have really struggled during the, the stay at home thing. Some of us are like, no way, man, I gotta be around, you know, I gotta be around people. And then there's others that just were like, man, this is just a really nice time of quiet and, in, and, and just enjoying that. Now, what this means is, is, is for an introverted pastor, let me share with you some of the struggles of an introverted pastor. There's actually, the studies show that there are about 25 to 40% of pastors are introverts. And so that means that uh, we do really love being around people. We love ministering to people, but we also th really love to be in quiet solitude time with God. We love to be able to read and just to, to just kind of recluse back. And that's why many times after church, sometimes I may, I may feel like I want to go run and hide in a hole for about you know, 24 hours just so I can kind of recoup. And being, being an introverted pastor is not, uh, it's what ends up happening is sometimes it can come across as that 
our hearts are not really being uh, portrayed very well. Sometimes we can come across as snobby. You know, we, we, you know, because they, we struggle sometimes with the idea of striking up new conversations or, or meeting somebody new for the very first time. It's, it's intimidating. It's, it's daunting a little bit. And you're like, I know what you're thinking, but you're a pastor. You're supposed to do those things. And say, yeah, I do. I do my very, I do my best. But there comes a point where I, all of a sudden, like, I just start to really question how I go about uh, talking to someone or, you know, small chat, small talk and things like that is not easy. And so sometimes it can come across as a little snobby, please know that that is, that is the last thing I want to, I, 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 I really do care and love all of you, and if I do come across that way, it is not by any means personal, it's usually I have something else going on in my mind or in my head, but as we, as we, look, as, as we look forward in, in, in all of that, I would imagine that there's a lot of us that have different personalities and different things that go on in our life and so there are I don't know there there seems to be a uh, the way we portray ourselves sometimes is a little different than we may see ourselves does that make sense that even though in our hearts we know that we're not that way but man we sure come across that way sometimes Sometimes we can, we can come across uh, as, as, uh, as maybe cold or, I don't know, I, I, I still come back to that word snobby. <laughs> it's a, that's a good word, a snob. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Circumstances that we're in, current situations that we're in, if we're stressed, if we're worried, if we're anxious, all of that comes to play as to how we interact or how we come across to other people. But then I have to ask the question, what happens when it's on purpose? (laughs) What happens when we are a snob purposefully? Now, none of us, I guarantee you, would want to admit that we are a snob. But I have to say that probably all of us has some snobbish tendencies. So let me tell you what a snob is. This is, this is a snob. A snob is a person who believes there's a correlation between social status and human worth. Snobs basically see certain people as inherently inferior to themselves based on beliefs, values, intellect, talent, wealth, education, beauty, ethnicity, religion, or just about anything. That covers a lot of gamut. So basically, I want to go back and look at that. Snobs basically think that they are better than someone else because or based on beliefs, values, intellect, talent, wealth, education, beauty, ethnicity, religion, or just about anything. So I can tell you this, Christians definitely are not snobby ever. I don't care who you are, we're guilty. We are guilty of that. Whether we want to admit it or not, many times we look at someone else and we rank. And you've done it, and I've done it, we've all done it. Well, at least I'm not as bad as, or at least I haven't done, or I can't believe they, we've done it. Now, I don't, no matter what side that you've been on, we've also been on both sides of it, have we not? We've been the ones that have been excluded, we've been the ones that have been put down, we've been the ones that have been judged, and we've also been the ones that have put down, we've also been the ones that have judged. We can fall on both sides, and we know how it feels to be on both sides. We know that sometimes when we are feeling better than someone else, we kind of puff up and we kind of, yeah... And then on the other side, we say, I can't believe they would treat me such a way. I can't believe they think that about me, or I can't believe. And so we've been on both sides, and we know how both sides feel. And here's the reality that it comes down to. That mentality, that way of living, that way of thinking is completely contrary to how Jesus lived. 
It's completely contrary to the way Jesus lived among us, and it's completely contrary to the way that he wants us to treat one another. It is not in his plan as citizens of the kingdom. He wants us to treat people in a way that he treats us. One of the things that you'll notice is that Jesus was extremely inclusive. He was extremely approachable. Jesus was probably one of the most approachable people that has ever lived on this earth. Uh, you gotta think about who he hung out with, who he spent time with. And I want us to take a look at a story or a parable that Jesus spoke in regards to this because he saw it in his day and I think that it applies to us in our day. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 18. As we take a look at a story that Jesus told to a specific group of people. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We're going to be starting in verse 9. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds as we read his word today. Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your example. Lord, forgive us where we have come across as snobs or when we've just flat out been a snob. Lord, I pray that as we read this, that you would speak to our hearts and you would open our hearts and our minds, that we really would be different once we are done hearing these words from you. I pray that you would anoint my lips and anoint my mind that the words that I speak would be from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 18, starting verse 9, it says, the Bible says, for he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Let's stop right there for a moment. We have to just look at the context of the parable. Who is this parable directed to? It is directed to people who consider themselves righteous, who think that they have it all together, that they follow all the rules, that they have all the truth, and that they have their life, basically their salvation intact. We also look at it that he's talking to those who treat others with contempt. Other versions would say or mean that he, they looked down upon other people. And so Jesus is specifically talking to snobs, to snobs. He thought that they, they thought that they were better than other people. They looked down on others. And so as he addresses this group of people, Here's what he says. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's look. Jesus is talking to the snobs. The reason that I use that is because I want us to make sure that we're not just getting stuck in old Pharisee versus tax collector language. The the thing is, is we've read this story and we know this story, we've heard this story, and it doesn't shock us the way that it shocked them. The people that were listening to this story they, the, the, what they were hearing was normal for a second. The Pharisee that would come and to pray the way that he prayed, he, it was not uncommon for him to separate himself from the other people that were there. 
You would be called a separatist. This is someone that really, truly did social distancing or physical distancing, but this time he did it between because not because of, of anything that was spreadable, but because he did not want to be associated. And so he goes before God, and he, st- he stands before God, and look at his prayer. It almost starts off like a psalm, but then it twists around when he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, (laughs) extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collectors. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Just a reminder, I know many of us know this already, Pharisees were religious leaders. They were very, very, very strict about the law they were uh they upheld themselves above everybody else they lorded their uh, education and their knowledge of the law and their execution of the law over other people they got people in trouble who didn't follow the law that they felt like that they should if they didn't keep the different laws and and they were also very 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 proud of who they were and what they could accomplish and there were people that that's just the way that they, they knew that Pharisees were. And so this was not uncommon for a Pharisee to say a prayer like this. Now, it's self-centered. It's focused on self. He's giving himself all the credit in the world. He's not giving God the credit. He just says, God, thank you that I'm not like somebody else. But he's going back and say, look what I do. I fast twice a week, which was more than what was expected or, or required. He gave all the tithes. And a lot, you know, I mean, Jesus even called it out that they, you know, they would tithe different, even pieces of mint right? Different herbs and things like that. So here is somebody that, that has followed the letter of the law all of his life. He's done everything that he's supposed to do, and he feels really good about it. And to the point where he even says, I am so glad that I'm not like this guy over here. God, I am so glad that I am not like everyone else who struggles with sin, who struggles with the ways of the world. I am so glad. I am so glad. Notice how he is standing by himself. He's all by himself. And then look at verse 13. The tax collector is standing far off. He is almost like he can't even come to the presence of the Lord. He feels so bad. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he comes across as being a very humble person. The Bible says that Jesus says that, but he beat his breast. In other words, it was almost like a sign of remorse. And he says this, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. One guy prayed how good he was. The other guy prayed how bad he was. One guy was extremely proud And the other one was not. And then Jesus, then Jesus says these words. This would be the equating of, you know, if we had a Pharisee versus a tax collector in those days, we could say a Sabbath school teacher or a deacon or an elder and a drug dealer or uh, Something along those lines. I mean, we're talking very, very vast, different ways of life and different choices and all those things. And here's what it says. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Justified. Declared righteous is what that means. Rather than the other. And then Jesus says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The reality is, is it's pretty hard to humble oneself, isn't it? (laughs) Have you ever heard someone say, I am the most humble person that ever lived. I am so humble, you would not believe how humble I am. Unfortunately, that happens. It's amazing to me 
how we as, as individuals, as humans, we really think that we're better than we actually are. We try to convince ourselves that what we've done, what we've said, all of those things is good. It's good enough. I'm, at least I'm not. And while even when we would look at this story and say, whew, thank God I'm not a Pharisee like that, you have just become the Pharisee in the story. And so have I. And you would think to yourself, when we look at this story and we ask ourselves, well, what, Pastor, what does this mean for us? Well, I believe that every single one of us have been guilty of this. Every single one of us has been guilty of this. Haven't you ever heard things like, well, they just don't know the truth like we do. Oh, they're just deceived once they know the truth. Oh, they just don't know any better. Or, they should know better. Or, they are just so worldly. You know what, that was just church talk. You want to go outside of the church for a second? (laughs) Man, they are such a liberal. Oh, such a conservative. Ah, they're just so ignorant. I can't believe they would believe something like that. Ah, they're such a sheeple. That's one I've been seeing lately. Any time that we make reference to a they, you have just separated yourself from someone else. Any time that we step out and put a they before it, to say they are this, or they are that, or can't they do this, I can't believe they, any time we do that, we have just become the Pharisee in the story, we've just become a separatist, we've just in, the, in, the, in that same sentence have just gone to a point to look, to say I know better, I am better, I know this, I know that, and so anytime we say oh they don't know any better, or they, they don't know the truth like we know the truth, or they all those things, I want us to remind ourselves something the remnant is not something that we stand up and say look at us we're better than you the remnant has much more responsibility than anybody else on this earth the remnant is one to show more love more compassion more grace than any other movement on the face of the planet the movement the movement the remnant is people that show God's love no matter what no matter the color of their skin no matter what socioeconomic level that you're in no matter how much education that you have we are to show love like no one else should shows our job our job is love that's what God has called us to do it's what Jesus said love God with all your heart and love people as I have loved you as Christ has loved the church we are to love one another he continues to say this is how This is how the world, this is how everyone is going to know that you are a follower of Jesus if you have love for one another. And I've got to tell you, church, I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you that this church has had the reputation of not being the friendliest of churches. This church has not had the reputation of being loving and kind. And you know why I say that? Because one, I've heard it, and number two, I've experienced it. I've been here for one year, and I've already encountered the, 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 the mean, harsh words of some of our fellow believing Christians, and I gotta say, no more. That is not how we as Christians will behave any longer. I will stop it, I will call it out, and I will not tolerate it anymore. This is to be a safe place for the people all over the world to come into here and to learn about Jesus, not to be run away by somebody's dumb words. You hearing that online? Because all of us in here, we're all perfect, so we're, I'm just... I look back at that verse that Elisa read in Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. 
Another version says tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people and even eating with them. The poor, the rich, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the blind beggars, the adulterers, the outcasts, the widows, even the children that they didn't want to bother Jesus. Jesus says, let the little children come unto me. Jesus was the most inclusive, approachable, full of love person. And if we want to love like that, then we too must be approachable. We must be loving. We have to be. And so here is what our call is for today. Don't be a snob. Loving is our job. Don't be a snob. Loving is our job. And love does. Love acts. Love stands. Love does something. It is not a mere word. It is something that is put into action. And so when you want to have some mean words that come flying out of your mouth or through your fingers on social media or through email or anonymous surveys? Yeah, I read those too. You have to read that. You have to understand that every time you do that, you are either growing the kingdom or tearing down the kingdom. And Jesus says that a house divided cannot stand. And if we're going to be divided here in this place or we're going to be divided in this world or we're going to be divided in this country, I promise you we will collapse, we will fail, and it won't work. But when we invite Jesus into the heart of our hearts and into the heart of this church and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and move us and transform us and change us and renew us, I'm telling you there's something powerful that the Holy Spirit can do. The Holy Spirit is what brings unity in a church. We can, we can fake it, we can act like it, we can say all the right words, but I'm telling you, it will be fake all the way through unless the Holy Spirit is genuinely changing our hearts. And I get it, there are people that we just, we don't know very well. We don't, we don't understand them very well. I understand all those things, but isn't that what we're called to do? Is to listen to one another, and to understand each other, and to love each other, and to be there for one another. Don't be a snob. Love is our job. The question is, is how? I mean, it's all, we know those words. I mean, things that I'm saying to you right now is not anything new. We know we're supposed to love. The question is, is how do we love? How do we go about doing that? How do we become approachable? How do we become inclusive? Well, the first thing we have to do is ask God to humble our hearts. We've got too much pride in us. We have too much self in here where we look at ourselves and we say, Ooh, look at, I'm so glad that I'm not like them or don't they know any better. That, you know, the root issue of sin, the root problem is, is all about what we want, when we want it, when all of those things, it's all about me. And it needs to be all about God. We are to be his, his followers. He is to be our ruler, our king, Everybody wants a savior, but not everybody wants a Lord. And here's the thing is, is Jesus needs to be both. He needs to be our Lord and our savior. He is our savior. He saved us. Now let him be our Lord. That means what he says, we do. What he calls us to, we do. No more talking bad about other groups of people. It's not okay. As Christians, not okay. Stop. We have to stop. Don't be a snob. Love is our job. Love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. I believe that we need to repent. I look at this story uh, uh, that Jesus told and I see a man who's come that doesn't, can't even enter into the temple, can't even be close, but all he can do, he doesn't even, barely has words to say, all he can do is beat his chest and say, God have mercy on me. He knows and while we, some people look at it and say, well, I didn't, I didn't see any words of repentance out of his mouth. We have no idea what's going on in his heart. And ultimately, Jesus says, that man right there has been declared righteous. He has been justified. He has been made new. His heart has been renewed. We as a church, I believe, we need to repent for where we have treated others in a way that is contrary to what God has wanted us to treat them. And you know what that means? 
It means that even those people that don't worship on the same day as us, we still love them with all of our hearts. We, even those that, that like someone that's different than us and doesn't like the same way as us, we still love them no matter what. Even when someone looks differently than us and has, has different backgrounds and, and different ethnicity, we love them no matter what. We are to be followers of Christ. And Christ never excluded anyone. And you know what that means? You say, hallelujah. You know what that means? That he didn't exclude us. If anyone deserved to be excluded from the kingdom of God, it's me. And yet Jesus, in his love, out of sacrifice, says, even while they are still sinners, even while we are still enemies, Paul says in Romans, even those, we, we have been saved because Christ died for us. Don't be a snob. Love is our job. Can you imagine what it would look like in your life by allowing God to re-examine our hearts and to look and to sh- shed a mirror, shed light into the darkness of our hearts that we could repent, that we could turn away from our wicked, evil ways of treating people differently or looking down upon them or being snobbish. Can you imagine what it would look like in your life to shift that around and to see people the way God sees people? But can you imagine a church? Can you imagine a church that was no longer snobby? (laughs) Imagine a church that admitted that we didn't have it all together, that we may not have all the truth, that we may not have all of our stuff together. Can you imagine if we just really admitted that, you know what, we are a group of broken people now, all of us are doing our very best to follow our God and to love people. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. But here's the thing is we will give God the credit when we do get it right and we will repent and we will turn away from when we get it wrong and we will allow God to shape us and to mold us into what he wants for our life. Can you imagine what it would look like for a church That if we just admitted it when we were wrong and we moved on and we forgave and we loved and we took care of one another no matter what. Don't be a snob. Love is our job. Don't be a snob. Love is our job. Don't be a snob. Love is our job. Father in heaven, Lord, what a... what a hard message for me to receive but one that I am grateful for. And Lord, as we as a church hear it and we listen to it and we uh, think about it and ponder it this week, it may be tough for us to hear. It may be, we may want to push back a little bit and say, that's not me. But God, show us where it is us. Reveal it in our hearts so that we may repent of it, that we may confess of it, that we can turn away and let you to, to lead us and to guide us in the direction that you want us to go. Lord, we want to be We don't want this to be about us. We want to be your hands and your feet. We want to show your love to the world. And Lord, it probably starts right here in this very room. If we can't show love in this place, how in the world could we show love outside of it? So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us, that you would lead us to the cross that we would confess it. And Lord, you promise that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Lord, I, I want to be, I want to be, I want all of us to be like you and how you loved people. I want us to be like that tax collector who, who admitted that he, he didn't have it going on, he didn't have it right, but he knew who did. And as he cried out, God, have mercy on me, Lord, we too cry out, God, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Make us new. Humble us. And Lord, put us out there to love your people no matter what. We thank you and we love you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you that have joined us online, I want to thank you so much for being a part of the service today. May God bless you abundantly. We're going to take that live stream off now, but may God bless you abundantly. For those of you that are here with us today, we are going to spend more time together. I invite you to come out to Pioneer Park. Uh, We're going to be having a picnic over there. We're just going to spend some time together, get to know each other a little bit more. Uh, If you already have plans and you're going someplace else, that's okay. We love you. We want you to be safe. Keep continuing to, to, to honor God with all of your time and effort and energy. When you spend time in God's word, ask those questions, God, what would you have me do? Look for people to show your love this, this next week. Remember, don't be a snob. Love is our job. May God bless you.